This is another episode of Design Your Dream Home with Doug and Steve. And now the architects, Doug Pat and Stephen Chung. You are listening to the Design Your Dream Home podcast with Doug and Steve. I'm Steve and that is Doug. Good morning, Doug. Good morning, Stephen. Boy, it's been a long time. Well, you know, the summer, the summer, it was hard to get our, our, get some guests. And I think you and I both took some time off. I went to Nova Scotia, which was awesome because I took my drone up there and flew around and saw some amazing um, architecture and just a natural environment and discovered the work of Brian McKay Lyons, who I, I'm just so impressed with now that I've seen some of it firsthand. So it was a, it was a good vacation. Wow. That sounds, that sounds so great, Stephen. Uh, one, one question, what are you doing to deal with all this rain? What is the deal? Are you getting as much rain there as we are here? Uh, we are just starting to get, uh, get this rain and I have a problem because today I have tickets for Fenway park and I'm afraid. that. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, that's the way it goes. Wow. Well, good luck with that, man. Well, it's good to see you, Steven. Good to see you. So today I am uh, thrilled because we tried very, for a very long time to get Mette Amat from Amat Plum, and they are an architecture firm based in Cambridge. I know of them because a former assistant of mine went to go work for them and, and raved about them. Um, so I wanted to get them on for a long time, and because they're busy, it was hard to kind of schedule that. But now we're in September, and I'm thrilled to have Mette join us today. Good morning, Mette. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Hey, so your story is pretty, um, pretty remarkable. Um, you know, I, I typically will do a, a background with a bio, where you went to school and all of these things. But of course, people, when they listen to this um, podcast can go to your website and learn all about that. So I think it's, um, I'd love to hear more about your story. Where did this slow space um, movement come from? That's what you're kind of, you're known for, I guess. Um. Yeah, I mean, it kind of grew out of necessity because um, my story really starts in grad school, where um, which was grueling, um, very difficult, and the stress of it. Um, you know, by the end, I got my uh, like three weeks after getting my degree, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, um, and I had been having very painful symptoms for the two years prior and kind of didn't know what it was and just sort of suffered through it. And that, and I already felt pretty burned out by the time I finished grad school and, and knew that I needed to go, I needed to go find a 40 hour a week kind of job. I wasn't good. I couldn't go and work for a Stark attack you know, at that time, like everyone was going to work for OMA, you know, and like, I just knew what that was going to be. And I, I just couldn't handle it. So and then I got the diagnosis, which was just terrifying because I had no idea what that was or what that was going to mean for me. Um, I had gone blind in my right eye during um, during the final preparations for my thesis. Like, uh, oh, you know, and, and I couldn't hold the exacto anymore to do the little cuts for my model. So my friends helped me out. Andrew, my partner, helped me out to finish my model and stuff like that. Anyway, so, um, you know, so we had just, uh, we, like, literally the day we were moving to New York City, packing up the truck, I was at the doctor's office and got this diagnosis. So, and we were moving to New York City, and it was like, you know, New York City is, like, crazy. It takes a ton of energy. Like, just living there and just working and stuff was, was very difficult. So, you know, we just... Um, you know, Andrew and I were, had already been together for a couple of years at that point, and you know, we um, we were uh, you know trying to figure out how we were going to um, do this profession that's notorious for um, you know difficult working conditions and you know sort of um, lots of work for low pay and uh, things like that, and we didn't really want to give up any of our dreams. Um, and so we wanted to be able to do good work, um, have a good life and make a good living. And um, when we said that, <laughs> most people, most other architects chuckled uh, and said, yeah, right. <laughs> nice try. Uh, and but, you know, uh, but we weren't, you know, we, we weren't going to give up. Um, and so it was just, it's just been a matter of like figuring out how we're going to do that. So, you know, we worked for a number of years and then we had the opportunity to, um, 
to start our own firm, which, you know, gave uh, me some flexibility in my work schedule and things like that. Um, and so, you know, over time, we realized that, um, you know, we were, we were trying to live this slow life, um, you know, in kind of the face of, uh, of kind of at odds with the rat race of, you know, of, of our profession, but also just uh, of everybody, um, you know, of everybody, we, we have kids, you know, the overscheduling and that, you know, everyone's so busy. I don't, I never see my friends. Everyone's so busy all the time. And, um, we realized that, uh, like it wasn't until two years ago, I'd even heard about the slow food movement and the slow movement in general. And it just sort of, dawned on us like oh my god that's what we're trying to do and we'd literally been joking for years that we were um you know we were the tortoise we were the you know we were the turtles slow and steady and while we had other classmates that graduated and made a big splash and you know were on the cover of architectural record and you know that kind of stuff and uh we were like okay we're just gonna plot along, slow and steady, wins the race, you know, that's, that's us. Um, and, and then the more we started to, you know, and, and during that time, of course, we we're also like, you know, just exploring with our own work and not really, not really knowing what it was that we were fundamentally interested in. I think we knew, but we didn't have the words for it. So what we were interested in about, in architecture was not what the GSD was teaching at the time. Uh, and so it, it had kind of gotten uh, suppressed. Um, and so and the GSD is Harvard, just for those listening. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so it was very conceptual at the time. And what we were really interested in was the experiential aspects of architecture um, and phenomenology and how, you know, how, how spaces and architecture makes you feel and how your body relates to that space. And interestingly enough, as we were learning about the slow food movement, um, you know, a, t a core principle of that is about enjoying the inherent pleasures of food, you know, sitting around the table with good family and friends and enjoying the sensual pleasures of food. And we, and we said, oh my God, that's, that's what we like about architecture. You know, we like the sensual pleasures of architecture the experience of it it's not the concept it's not the form it's not the um you know it's not the sort of crazy um technologically cutting edge um it's about how it makes us feel and that's what that's why we do what we do that's why we love architecture because we actually think it can make people's lives better um and so you know once we started thinking about that, we're like, you know, we started to, we started to understand the slow food movement and started to learn about that and think about how we could model a movement um, within architecture and construction that kind of mirrored the slow food movement. And there have been those things in, in almost every other industry, you know, there's like slow education, there's slow cities, there's slow, um, uh, slow film, slow, um, yeah, uh, like literally every other thing, there's something, you know, there's some kind of a, um, there's some kind of a corollary thing, but not in architecture and, uh, not in construction. And that's odd because it has such a big impact on people's lives, you know, and, uh, and we felt like it was really about time that architecture slowed down a little bit. You know, we were just uh, kind of, I think we've just sort of um, hit the hit the end of the Starchitect period, you know, and uh, and that sort of came to an apex and it's like, you know, um, it, and, and it's it just more and more and more like kind of bigger, more grandiose buildings for just for the sake of building them without really thinking about, um, the impact on the people using them. Um, it just became eye candy for architecture magazines. Um, and it just didn't feel like it had any essential value to, um, to, to people. And it's the people that are kind of missing from the whole discussion. Um, and so we, 
So we modeled a movement after the slow food movement and used their principles. Um, they used the principles of good, clean, and fair, which we thought worked just great for architecture as well. Good, clean, and fair. So the slow food, uh, the slow space movement is slow food for the built environment, and it is uh, promoting buildings that are good, clean, and fair for all. Doug, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, sure. I have a bunch of questions, but the last <laughs> thing you said there, uh, good, clean, and fair. So could you elaborate on those three? Uh, absolutely. Words? Yeah, absolutely. So um, good. What is what is a good building? So by our definition, uh, a good building is one that is uh, designed for people. So human-centered design, designed for your use and experience, not just for profit or not just for uh -huh. Uh, showmanship or you know or whatever but actually designed for people uh, it a good building should be beautiful if a building is not beautiful nobody will love it I'm sorry nobody will love it and they won't take care of it and it won't last um, and so and this is one of those things that people stopped talking about beauty and architecture at some point and that is to be one of the fundamental principles of architecture it should be beautiful it should delight and when it when it does it not only enhances the life of the users it enhances the lives of all the people who see it and are you know come into contact with it uh, and the last one is that it should last a hundred years it should it, it I think that if it Lasts a hundred years. I live in a house that's a hundred years old. Once it makes it to a hundred years, it's sort of crossed a threshold. It can go another two hundred, and people are going to take care of it. Um, and uh, and you know, it's got it's got the bones that it can keep going from there. But so many buildings now, especially in residential. Okay, so um, I was talking a little bit before about sort of institutional big commercial buildings, but in residential architecture, so many new homes. Uh, McMansions, uh, uh, for example, they're going to last 30, 40 years tops, tops, you know, and then it's, um, and then it's to the landfill, you know, and it's the wrecking ball and, you know, there's really nothing to salvage. So buildings need to be designed to last a hundred years. So that's good. All right. What's clean? Clean is um, non-toxic for people and the planet. Um, it is, uh, you know, non, non polluting, it's health, healthy, natural materials, um, non polluting in their production and their use. Um, so this is kind of a, you know, it's our own, um, take on the sort of green movement, but less about energy efficiency and just about materials and what is, um, you know, what is healthy and like, you know, since the 1950s, the chemical industrial complex has pretty much taken over the building industry and everything, you know, practically everything that buildings are typically built of are some sort of plastic polymer. <laughs> and, um, you know, vinyl, um, vinyl, PVC pipes, this is one of the most toxic things on the planet. When PVC is produced, uh, it releases dioxins into the atmosphere. So when PVC is produced, um, it releases dioxins into the atmosphere. And just to give you an idea of what dioxins are, um, you've heard of Agent Orange in the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. Agent Orange is dioxins. So it kills everything, uh, you know, and everywhere. And um, so when it's produced, PVC creates that. It's also um, the bioaccumulative, so it never disappears. It just continues to accumulate in the atmosphere. And also when PVC burns, it also releases those dioxins. So have you ever thought about what happens when a house clad in vinyl siding burns? Oh, like, that's... just imagine the smell, right? And then, and then, okay, thank you, neighbor. You've just released like thousands of carcinogens right into my neighborhood that I'm going to be breathing in, you know? So it's like, yuck, you know? 
<laughs> it's just yuck. Um, and so there's that. Then my other my other favorite example is um, spray foam insulation, which like, you know, the insulation guys are hard hitting selling right now to consumers. And hey, you know, homeowners, public service announcement, when the guys show up to install your insulation in hazmat suits, ah. you ah. really need to think twice. Okay, <clears throat> it's a two part chemical compound that has to mix properly. And they don't tell you that in 5% of the cases, it never cures. Oh my God. So you've got that stuff sprayed on that is so super sticky, you will never get it off. That is equivalent to totaling your house. You cannot live there. Uh, you know, it is disastrous. So it's everyone's favorite insulation right now because it gives you a great R value. Okay. Mm -hmm. But, um, the, the government does not monitor chemicals, uh, that are used in commercial products. Companies can put any kind of chemical they want in any material without having tested it, uh, in terms of, um, health and toxicity before use. So it's not until 30 years later when we, when we find out that asbestos was a bad thing. It's not until a lot of people die that we find out that, you know, lead was a bad idea. You know, and, and so um, I'm, I'm arguing for a healthy skepticism of new products. Uh, and I would like to just say, can we just please use the stuff that the earth has provided for millennia, you know, let's use inert natural materials, um, wood, stone, you know, wood, wood is great. Wood, um, sustainably harvested, renewable, uh, you know, sequesters CO2. Um, you know, I, I, I was just looking up a, a thing. Uh, I'm going to post this. I'm going to share this to my, uh, Facebook group, but, um, uh, a, a debate about wood cutting boards versus plastic cutting boards. Have you ever heard about this? Well, anyway, oh. so, you know, people think that plastic cutting boards are more sanitary because you can clean them more easily, but they get these grooves in them and um, the bacteria sit in the grooves and it's really hard to get them out. The wood actually absorbs the bacteria down into its pores and within a matter of minutes, the bacteria dies. So the wood is actually naturally antibacterial. Uh, and, uh, and so think about that, you know, it's just a cutting board, whatever, but think yeah. about that. And then like, take it to the scale of your house. We use well, it every day. So we use it every day and take it to the scale of your house. And like, you know, wood is a naturally antibacterial material. So have that around as opposed to everything in plastic. And, you know, think, of, think about that next flu season. You know, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> uh, so let's see, where was I going with that? So that that's in a nutshell what clean is, you know, clean for people, uh, planet and uh, animals, uh, you know, and, and everything. Um, so my rule of thumb is, um, na you know, natural products that we have been using for thousands of years that have the, that have stood the test of time. Okay, asbestos is actually a natural product. Okay, but now we know that that is toxic. So, you know, things like that. It's not like a, a hard and fast rule. But in my house with my kids, um, chemicals chemicals and plastic are bad, are bad words. Um, so we, we stay away from those things. All right, so the last one is FAIR. Um, have you ever heard of um, FAIR trade coffee? Of course. Yeah. Fair trade chocolate. Sure. Yeah, because, um, you know, cocoa beans are, um, you know, they're harvested, they're essentially harvested by child slave labor wow. in developing countries. Um, guess what? So are a lot of our building products. Yeah. Um, you know, exotic hardwoods, slave labor in Brazil. Yeah, I was going to say mahogany is a big one. Big one. Yeah. Big one. And, um, all of those, um, all of the, you know, probably pick any, you know, pick any ore or something, you know, that we, people like to use on commercial buildings, you know, um, 
you know, whatever, zinc or something like that, you know, and it's like guaranteed there's like some oh. population of people that is essentially being enslaved. Right. They're to dying off mining it. Mining it. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. And so we need to have <laughs> fair trade building products, huh. you know. We need to have fair trade building products, um, and the only thing that sta stands up to, you know, that comes close right now would be, in my mind, would be FSC certified wood, uh, because they do have a chain of custody, um, and um, and and th and thinking about using um, locally sourced materials, so American materials, or at least um, materials from. Uh, countries that have labor laws, that it, as opposed to importing it from China, where you know, like marble uh, marble harvesting in China, I can only imagine what the conditions <coughs> are of of workers there, right? So I don't know what they are. I I just think that uh, where we are in um, in Massachusetts, there is a um, there is a marble quarry in. Vermont. I always try to get people to um, get the locally sourced, um, the locally sourced marble because at least we do have laws in this country um, that protect workers. That's not a lead point thing. That's not a 500 mile thing. That's just a do the right thing thing. Um, and um, and that marble is gorgeous. And yes, you're going to pay a little bit more for it, you know. But you, then you're also supporting local jobs. Because you know what, uh, construction cannot be sent overseas. You got to build it here, right? So these are good jobs. We need we need good jobs right here locally, um, and and that's the other thing. So we do have laws in this country, but that doesn't mean that exploitation doesn't happen. And actually, in the residential construction um, uh, market, it's rampant. So um, your contractor with a pickup truck and five guys that jump out of the back. Okay, those guys are not being paid a fair wage. They're being paid under the table, uh, off the books, and therefore day laborers, they're being paid off the books, therefore they're not paying into our um, social security system. They're not paying um, unemployment or workers comp. Um, they're obviously not getting any benefits and they're often not being paid a fair wage and they're being, um, because they're off the books, they have no recourse. So the superintendent's like, oh, you're not happy with the conditions here? Okay, if you don't come, I'm not paying you for the last two weeks. Mm. Um, and they have no recourse. This is regardless of whether or not they're um, documented or undocumented. These you could be American citizens or not, you know, it's... Um, but the exploitation in residential construction is so common that I, I participated in it myself without even realizing it. You know, when I hired a cheap contractor, because that's all I could afford, and they show up, you know, and, the, and the, the truck opens up in the back and 10 guys spill out, you know, are like, oh, it never occurred to me that the wow. job boss was exploiting his own countrymen, you know, and that like, what kind of conditions did they, um, did they live in? Were they being paid fairly? So this, this is, um, this is modern day slavery. And the, the UK has recently passed a bill um, to fight against modern day slavery. And the construction industry is ranks one of the highest in terms of its, um, it's susceptibility to modern day slavery. Um, in the in the news, there has been um, there have been some things um, written about this happening where there's a lot of migrant labor to the Middle East to build a lot of these really big buildings. Um, Zaha Hadid was um, was in the news about uh, because her uh, FIFA World Cup stadium was um, you know people people were dying left and right. Uh, and these are people that come, they come from other countries, they get sponsors that bring them over, they sequester their passports, so they have, uh, they have no chance to leave. They're housed in workers' camps. They're literally like concentration camps in the middle of the desert, like eight guys to a room, 
you know, uh, and then they're working 20 hours a day um, in the middle of Qatar under the 120 degree wow. heat, yeah. right? And like horrific conditions. So some of that has, you know, some of that has gotten some play. But even um, even in Boston, there's um, even in Massachusetts, there's uh, you know, it's called wage theft when you when you pay someone under the table. Um, there have been three thousand complaints of wage theft in the last few years in Boston alone. That's just the people who actually complained. Most people would not do not complain. So um, fair labor. Uh, fair trade is a dirty little secret in the construction industry. And, um, you know, when clients complain about how expensive it is and they say, oh, but my neighbor did that for like, my neighbor did their bathroom for like $10,000. <laughs> right. It's it's either HGTV, you know, like getting the better <laughs> of us or, um, or, or there's, um, there's exploitation that's happening. Um, and that's something I think we need to, uh, we all need to be aware of. Um, and so whether it's, you know, in our backyard or overseas, um, this, that's not right. It's not right. Well, well that's there's a lot there. there. <laughs> <laughs> Go, ahead. Go ahead, Stephen. No, you go. Well, I, I, I have a million questions for, you. I am so impressed by how passionate you are, um, regarding, um, the, these aspects of building. Uh, I, one more question, then I'll let Stephen go. Um, and you don't have to answer this if you don't want to. Um, I, I uh, just briefly, I have, a neuro, I have a neurological condition which affects, uh, it's a movement disorder, it affects my eyes. And it's, it's recent within the last couple of years, but it's changed the way I see my life. And I was just wondering, uh, clearly, you know, you're a passionate person. I'm wondering how MS has changed your perspective on your own life and your work. I, I would think it has. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, you know, it's, um, I, you know, my, my analogy for me is like, um, I'm like a race car with an empty gas tank. Huh? And so, you know, I want to go, I want to go a hundred miles an hour and I just can't, I'm really a type A person and I, I just, I, I just don't have the gas. So it's about, uh, it's been about, <laughs> I'm, I'm constantly, you know, 10, 15 years in, I'm still, I'm still making mistakes and I'm still trying to retrain myself, but it's about trying to think about doing less, but better, um, and, uh, focusing my energy and focusing my practice, my life, you know, on the things that are truly important. Um, and, you know, finding that one thing that is, um, that is sort of my life's work, um, as, a, as opposed to, um, trying to do lots, lots of, uh, lots of different things. So, uh, you know, and sort of c finding this sort of the slow space movement and realizing that it really tied together everything that we were interested in about our lives, how we wanted to live our lives, how we wanted to practice architecture and how we wanted to make a difference in the world. That's just, that's beyond just, um, you know, doing, doing projects for private clients, like has, it is entirely shaped by the fact that I have to focus, uh, you know, that I have to, um, that I have to narrow in and be strategic and, um, you know, work smarter, not harder. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I, that has been a gift that wisdom, you know, is like, is rare to get, you know, at age 30 because my, all my other friends at that time were, um, had tons of energy. They could do, you know, they could do anything. They could do whatever they want. They could, you know, they could spin their wheels endlessly and there was still more energy. Um, but I couldn't, so it, it forced me to focus and that is, um, that's been so valuable. Yeah, that's helpful. Very interesting. Steven. Well, you, you know that, um, Matt, both Doug and I have done some, some television. We talked about the slow movement. There's also the slow TV movement. I'm not sure how it's doing, but I talked to this travel channel executive at one time and they talked about this new program they had where they basically have a camera on a cruise ship and it's like 12 hours of programming that you just turn it on and all it is is your movie. <laughs> 
like so slowly through yeah. this beautiful scenery. And I think that's not going anywhere. And the guy says, well, <laughs> it's like 12 hours of programming and it's almost free and it actually works. It's kind of like people tune in and they, they just sit there kind of mesmerized and they sort of do other things, but it's sort of like your friend. They also have, they, they also cover yarn competitions where they basically for 12 hours, will just watch people do yarn and people find, they sit there and they watch, they just tune in and they, they find it relaxing and, Gosh, I think in this age where you're trying so hard to fill programming time in there, they sort of came up with this approach. I was sort of cynical about it, but actually they say there are surprisingly a lot of people that really it somehow works for them. And really, they slow down. They slow down. They, they like that pace. So it's interesting. I, I think we all really need it. I mean, we're all so, you know, we're, we're in the rat race, whether we whether we acknowledge it or not. And it's mm-hmm. intense. I mean, with like the amount of media we consume every day, you know, and 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 everything and everybody's everybody's in on it. So the pressure from all around is, um, you know, I mean, like my kids don't do any activities. And like I I feel like. I feel like a, like a weirdo. You know, I'm a weirdo. My kids are a terrible come, parent. <laughs> I don't think I'm a terrible parent. I actually think I'm a good parent, but I think I'm a weirdo because they just come home and play. I think kids should just play, you know? And so, but like, if you look around and it's like, oh, their friends are in this and that and that. Slow parenting is another one, by the way. Oh. Um, you know, all these different uh, activities. And it, it's like, you're kind of like, okay, it's really hard to stay the course. Right. When the pressure is it's not like people are telling you you should do that, although they do tell me I should I should do this, that and the other thing. But um, you just see that's what everyone else is doing. We naturally just want to do what everyone else is doing because we think, well, somebody must know what what's going on. Right. They must know better than me. They right? must. <laughs> how, how do you think that this. Um, so how does this your, your work, your art, let's say architecture work, this this philosophy, how does it work for a client? I'm a homeowner and I want to hire a lot to plum to work with me on a renovation or a new house or something. How, how does this affect me? Your, your philosophy besides all the great things you talked about in terms of materials and some of these other, but just tell me how this whole slow space movement would, how would I feel that if I'm going to work with you? Yeah. So I think every client kind of engages with it on a different level. Um, you know, our website is, full of it's plastered all over our website so you know it's like um uh so the first thing is okay you know have you seen our website have you seen what we're about um uh and so some people come to us exactly for that like that that slow space uh, mentality that's exactly what we want you know so and so forth other people are like yeah that sounds good you know whatever um Uh and and so um in terms of the in terms of the good, uh, the human-centered design, the beautiful, the um, uh, enduring quality, I mean, that's just what we're going to do. You know, we're just not going to, um, we're just not going to, uh, th- that's just, that's just our design philosophy. We're just going to, we're going to do good design. And I think our portfolio shows that and, you know, and um, we're just, uh, you know, there are different degrees, you know, there are different budgets and things like that, but we, we're still going to look for the beautiful, long lasting, um, you know, human centered solution. Um, in terms of the clean, we're always, um, we're always presenting them with, uh, the best options and they're not always picking them, but we are trying to Mm -hmm. educate them. Um, and you know, and, and that's, that's kind of, um, you know, that's kind of the best we can do at this point. You know, of course I can't force somebody to spend, uh, more money on, um, copper pipes versus PVC pipes, but I can educate them and I can tell them about what the difference is and mm-hmm. they can make that choice for themselves. So we don't, um, uh, so we'll pre- will sort of spec copper initially. And then, um, you know, if it gets down to that line item in the budget and it's like looking to save costs, okay, we can, okay, we'll discuss it. We'll always present the, um, best practice. And for us, the best practice is good, clean and fair. Um, and so we're always looking for materials that are, um, you know, that are, uh, locally made, either locally made that we know are fair trade, which is very difficult. So, um, or, um, you know, things like that, we're 
building our library of, uh, of materials that are slow materials um, to use. And we'll always present those um, and talk about their benefits and the client may or may not choose it. And then, you know, um, I'm not here to, you know, shove anything down anyone's throat you know it's it's their house and it's their their money and so they make the choice but at least at least we're there and we're making the argument um and they and, came to you right so i mean they read they, your they read your yeah. story they know what you're about and it, yeah. but it's not like you're forcing it on them it's more like same with the contractor so you you bid the con you bid the, the you know the job out and Maybe there's one that has all of these things that you're looking for, but he's twice as expensive. And there's one that maybe is a little, not sketchy, but somehow was not doing everything maybe the way you like. And ultimately, it's their choice, but you can sort of educate them. That's kind of the philosophy. Yeah. And we're also starting to do our own building. So oh, okay. we've, we're transitioning into a design build firm. And that's oh, really? another way that we can control um, the labor, um, and we can control the sourcing of materials um, much better. And so then we can set our own rules, like, um, you know, we don't hire day laborers, um, you know, and we have, we have, you know, we make sure everyone is vetted, we make sure that the workers' comp policies are, you know, up to date. I mean, these are things you're supposed to do by law, but, but so often doesn't get done. Um, and so, uh, and so we can start to control that. Um, and, and so we just, we hire reputable subcontractors and we vet them and we make sure that, um, you know, they're doing everything by the book and we're doing everything by the book. Uh, quick question. So, uh, I, so I was going through the website and I, I do see that you guys are getting involved in design build work. Um, and you talked a lot about this experiential aspect of architecture and how important that is to you guys. Do you find that being involved in design and build will help you guys with the ex experiential parts uh, of uh, the architecture and design? Yes, absolutely. Because it's not just um, it's not just about designing something on paper. It's about how it how it comes out, the execution, mm -hmm. and whether or not that has the effect that we wanted to have. Right. And so even when we were just doing the architecture, we were always extremely involved throughout construction. And so, you know, you need to, it's, it's about, you know, 10% inspiration, 90% perspiration. Right. So you need to get, you need to follow it through the whole way to make sure that, um, that the, your, your lofty goals for the, you know, the experience of the space actually manifest. Um, and so you need to be right there the whole time, whether you're, you know, you, you're acting as the architect or the builder, um, you know, or some combination of the two, but you got to be right there all the way through. So the, the Hamptons beach house, that filigree on those metal panels. Yeah. I mean, these photographs are amazing. Is it as incredible to experience that space? It looks unbelievable. Unbelievable and changing throughout the day, right? Oh, wow. And so, right. Right. right, so because the sun's moving, and yeah. so you know, like every time, every time throughout the day, it's uh, you know, it's a different, it's a different experience, and yeah. then it also has the benefit of um, there are neighbors like not 15 feet away, but you, oh, wow. you, you don't experience they're, they're there to screen out the neighbors, okay. Um, because um, they're like these long skinny lots and yeah. you know they're all kind of um, sliced up yeah and um, but when you're there you d you're alone I mean yeah. you know there's nothing you have that foregrounded thing and then you have this light on light play on top of it that is just it's like otherworldly yeah. yeah yeah those CNC'd and who designed them um, we worked with, uh, with an illustrator and graphic designer, oh, wow. uh, to That's do so that. So it's a custom pattern yeah. and they are, they were water jet cut aluminum okay. and they're also, we designed the openings, um, so that they met the, um, hurricane standards. Sure. So, uh, so that no, no opening is bigger than a two by four projectile, right? Yeah. So it also acts as hurricane screen. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Wow, I'm so glad you hired an artist to do those. That's wonderful. yeah, yeah. And let's so for our listeners, where can they go to see this project and and learn more about uh, your your firm? Um, on our website, the projects page, um, they can go to Hampton's Beach House. And your website is www. 
omotplum.com, which I will spell A-A-M-O-D-T-P-L-U-M-B. Awesome. So that's fantastic. And I know you're active on Twitter. And what other social media do you, do you use to, if people want to follow you and learn more about what you do? Uh, Instagram, Facebook, uh, and LinkedIn. <laughs> that's enough, right? <laughs> I think so, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Hey, so this is awesome because, you know, in the past, what we've done is that we've asked our architects, our guests, not always architect designers, to talk about three things that maybe a homeowner could sort of take away. But, of course, you've done a lot more than that already. So that's that's fantastic without even being asked. So I appreciate that. Hey, Doug, is there any 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 last questions? I don't want to keep um, Mete any longer. She, I know no. she's got to practice. And she's got, she has only so much time. <laughs> Absolutely. It's been <laughs> really wasted on us. Yeah, Meta, it's been great uh, to meet you, and it's been a wonderful conversation. I wish you guys all the best. Oh, yeah, thank you really so much. Yeah, fascinating and, and, and exciting to see. Well, not, I mean, it's, it's such an interesting story to hear how your life is translated into your architectural vision and how you're executing that now, and it's all, it's all very inspiring. I mean, we're like you. We have kids. We're trying to figure out what to do. It's, there's everything going on. It just, it's just, it's, yeah, it's very hard, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's 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 uh, really hard. <laughs> God, it's so hard to be a grown up. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> exactly right. No, but it's really amazing. I'm, and thank you so much for joining us. I I knew that this would be good, and and I was right. So well, we will um we will be sharing this through our own social media platforms, and we want you to do the same. You know, I think people would be interested to hear what you have to say. It's a very different kind of voice than uh, I think many of our other guests. So I think it's a, a great a great podcast. Awesome. Thank well, thank, thanks so much for having me. And um, Stephen, I hope we can get together sometime for a drink. Absolutely. absolutely. That would be drink. great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. <laughs> We're neighbors, so that's Our cool. Neighbors. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks. So you've been listening to Design Your Dream Home with Doug and Steve. Remember to shoot us an email with any questions. We love to hear from you guys. So thanks for joining us, and we look forward to the next time. Thanks, Meta. Yeah. Wow, you have a great radio voice. He does, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, really good. I'm like, yeah. wow. It's a pro- professional announcer. <laughs> right <Yeah>. on. <laughs>